What's up, everybody? Welcome to this Q&A video. This is very informal, so I'm not gonna make any weird cuts of my ums and erms, but, uh, you know, I did a video on money and YouTube, um, primarily about how much YouTube paid me in four years' time, and I also asked a question on Instagram, and over 250 people replied, so I just wanted to make a separate Q&A video. If you don't have all the time in the world, make sure to check the description below because I'll write out all the questions I address in this video so you can fly through all the questions that resonate with you the most. So you don't have to sit through the whole entire like boring ass video, but just see what you wanna see. I don't care about audio retention rates in this video, so go nuts on the timestamps. So let's start. First, I'll read the question that was, I need your help. I'm a right, <laughs> wow. I'm writing a video about money. Topics like how much money I made over four years time on YouTube through ads, sales, and affiliates, etc. But also the amount of work I've gotten from being present on YouTube. Do you have any questions regarding YouTube and money? Let them know and I'll try to address it in, and I'll try to address as many as possible in a Q and A section at the end of the video. Let's just start from the top. NDM Production says, what is your biggest investment excluding video gear? I guess that's my car. Uh, don't know if this is the answer that you wanted, but it was 15,000 euros, so that's a lot of money. I don't care what kind of car it is, as long as it's big, so I need to bring all my stuff, you know, needs to be big enough, and it's reliable and trustworthy and rather new, um, so I can trust it. Trust is the most important one. Next is Visuals of Lars. Uh, starting as a filmmaker um, costs quite a lot of money. How did you start investing in your business? Well, I started with a Sony A6500 with a Sigma 16mm 1.8 lens, and then a 35 1.8 lens, or 1.4 even. And these lenses were amazing. Uh, this camera was amazing. And I really soon after bought a gimbal, and this was basically of the money I, I earned as a full-time employee somewhere. So as I, you know, progressed through my field, you know, uh, as a filmmaker, I could purchase new stuff, but it was definitely not from me making videos because I didn't earn anything from me making videos. It was basically all the money I earned as a production assistant on uh, film sets that I could then pump back into my business and, you know, get better cameras and all that sort. At some point, I bought a BMPCC 4K with a little bit of help of my mom. Um, and that actually started a lot of good because... I suddenly had beautiful imagery, but also was able to sell my work for a higher price because the image was more beautiful and I felt more confident. So yeah, um, it goes gradually, but I did have side hustles on the side. As a filmmaker, I definitely did not make all my money from making videos only. All right. Redstone Productions, how do you deal with the US asking taxes for your YouTube ads? I have no idea. I honestly don't care. I just, you know, see whatever YouTube ads come in as a bonus because I make money as a filmmaker. I don't really mind how much YouTube pays me for ads. Um, taxes are taxes. It's just the way it is. Uh, in Holland, we pay loads of taxes as well. So it's, to me, I don't really mind. Maybe I should take it more seriously, but, you know, there's so much in this whole game that requires your attention. And this is definitely not one that I would like to, you know, look into. <laughs> Sorry if that's not your uh, desired qu uh, answer, but Yoast asks, um, tell me about working for gear versus money and how much it mostly sucks. Um, well, to be honest, this channel did uh, offer me a lot of ways to work for gear because you know, in the filmmaking niche, there's a lot of gear being produced and, you know, manufacturers searching for ways to get it out in the open. Um, but it is really hard at first. If you start out, you know, if 200 subscribers and then suddenly a brand comes to you and says like, hey man, we want to sponsor you. We want to give you like uh, five lights and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, but we need this uh, kind of video and this in return, yada, yada. At first you feel super happy and super stoked that you can do something like that. But what what happened to me is the fact that my channel changed into a review channel um, and suddenly I was reviewing gear that I didn't care about, like a microphone, you know, like a small Fifine microphone. I didn't care about it, you know, I started reading stuff from Harry Potter because I just had no idea what to do. So, it, you know, you have to be careful because 
if you just say yes to everything, suddenly your whole channel is being shaped by the brands that want something of you. So uh, at some point I started to say no, and that was actually the, the moment where I started to feel free and you know could create whatever I wanted to create. Uh, so you need to find a balance in that. Astrid Grave, it's Dutch, so I'll translate it down here. Je krijgt werk omdat je bedrijven hier zien, omdat bedrijven hier zien op YouTube, hoeveel gratis projecten en onkosten krijg je, nou aangeboden ten opzichte van goed betaalde klussen daarmee, een, een toffe reis die bijvoorbeeld niks oplevert. Well, the difficult thing is in the beginning, you know, say um, before I, I, I crossed 5,000 subscribers, it was hard to get a lot of money for something I did on YouTube. But as your channel grows and as your popularity, say, grows, your name also grows and people start to trust you more, I guess. Um, and now I'm talking mostly about brands like, like Sony and Artlist and, 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 you know, all those brands. They, they trust you more whenever you get more subscribers. And that's the reason because more people are likely to find the video where you talk about their product. I mean, it's, it's simple as that. But, you know, projects that have nothing to do with YouTube, but just people that found you through YouTube are usually just well paid because that's, that, you know, me as a freelancer being hired and not the YouTuber shoe that's being hired for like an ad role or something. So, of course, I did a lot of free jobs in the, in the beginning. A lot, I mean a lot, you know, but also YouTube videos that I made out of my own sort of excitement, um, you know, I lost money on that, but it's all part of it, you know. Now I can say that I make good money from making those videos, but in the past, you know, like before I, I've reached 5,000 subscribers, for example, definitely not. I lost money on those videos, so yeah, it's a balance, you know, but... At first, I'd say the first three years, you just have to go all out and you have to work on the side really hard to get the money to then sustain your own fun projects and to get your name out there and to build whatever you want to build, you know, to shoot whatever you want to shoot, if that makes sense. All right, next up, Nathan Decker. Nathan helped me with a lot of videos, so that's cool. Um, Prijs opbouw, productie, achterzijde, uh, hoe je je bedrijf gezond houdt met geld. So... Yeah, that's difficult. I mean, I went to, to Indonesia and I basically just blew my entire budget through uh, and I, I didn't make a dime on that project, but it was really cool. So I don't think I'm the best person to ask how to budget your projects, but, um, you know, you'll learn by doing, I think. The only thing is, that's something I learned from 2022, you have to reserve taxes. I did not do it, so I'm screwed. But... That's, you know, part of it as well. And also by doing that once wrong, you'll learn, and you'll never do it again. So I think it's just a, a matter of, of learning by doing, just falling, standing up, trying it all over again. Mm, you know, cliche things, but that's basically what it is. Um, Simon Erlings, please tell me how to get rich. Well, don't start a YouTube channel. Maybe you get rich in the long run, but, you know, in the first five years, you definitely don't get rich. Matthijs de Deugd, how to balance adding value versus also seeing YouTube as a business? Um, that's a really interesting question because I have seen YouTube as a business a couple times and all those times when I did see it as a business, I lost all the motivation in the world to do anything for YouTube. So I just realized that I need to make the videos that I feel passionate about doing and try to pull it away from the business as far as I can. My business is me being a cinematographer or filmmaker, shooting projects that I you know, like to do, documentary, all that sort. So that's my business. YouTube is an extension of the business, but I just cannot see it as a money-making tool because whenever I do that, I lose the motivation. I start to see it as work, you know. Um, but yeah, it's really difficult to balance those things. Uh, I just really think that reflection moments, you know, moments that you just sit down and just check with yourself, like, am I still having fun making YouTube videos? Um, and, and what can I do to change that is really important. Uh, and I do those pretty much every week with my girlfriend during the weekends with Frank on the office. You know, I just go over those topics all the time and, we'll, and I'll just analyze with myself, if I still find it fun to do. Um, and I noticed whenever I start making videos about self-development or sleep or all those things, or at least think about those videos, you know, prepping those videos, researching for those videos, script writing for those videos, I'll become a happier person. So, yeah. So, long answer short, I'll try to, you know, take YouTube as far away from the business as I can. 
in order to keep it fun. Gnarly Newton asks, is it worth starting a YouTube channel as a new professional in the game? Yes. Um, if you don't have a lot of work yet, I think it's super valuable to start a YouTube channel because you can spend your time making videos. You'll get better at it. Uh, you'll learn a lot. You'll learn a lot of the business side as well. So it's, in my opinion, one of the best things to do. And it also gains you a little bit of exposure. So I just see a win-win. But having said that, if you already have a sustainable client base and you do you know, work for cool clients and whatnot, then maybe it's difficult to start a channel you know, alongside of those jobs because you're, already, because you're already working hard. So something to think about. But if you have the time, definitely start a YouTube channel. Long answer short. All right. Next up, Maurice Attenbrink. Does your online status affect the amount of money you ask or what budgets budget the companies expect? Really good question. Um, I think it's fair to say that that's a yes because the more videos I made for YouTube, the more I learned, uh, the more confidence I've gotten. Um, yeah, and the more money you, you dare to ask. It's that simple. You know, if you're a beginning filmmaker and you've made like seven videos in your life, it's really hard to ask 800 euros a day, you know, because you just don't feel confident enough. That's also something I say to people that I, you know, help with this stuff is you, you, you ask whatever you feel comfortable with. You know, it doesn't make sense if you asked 800 euros a day and you feel sick to the stomach because you, you asked that amount of money. It's gradually increased over time. But to give you an example, three and a half years ago when I was a pr uh, production assistant, I worked for 250 euros a day, 300 euros sometimes. Then I started doing film jobs and those film jobs usually involved like a bit of pre-production, shooting, editing. And that was like four or five days work. And I did it for like 600 euros, 500 euros. That gradually increased to 1000 euros. And then I started to invest in more camera equipment, have my entire pocket, like, you know, black magic pocket camera set. And then I suddenly was asked to do small commercials. And then I could ask 800 euros for myself and all my equipment, you know, so then I gradually started to increase my price also because I felt more confident talking about money. Um, aiming high is not always the best thing to do. Um, because I think a seasoned producer will definitely notice whenever you're not confident to talk about money. That's what I think. But uh, yeah, so online status, I don't really know. I don't feel like I'm cocky because of YouTube. Uh, I just feel like I'm, you know, my humble self trying to make it in this business in some way. So, um, and still, I mean, I'm the easiest when it comes to money. Uh, if someone wants to shoot something with me, at first I'll, I'll tell them my price. But if they say like, hey, we have half and it's a cool project, I'll do it, you know, so. That's me trying to stay humble and also appreciating the fact that I can do this work. You know, in the end it's work, but if I have the tools and the, and the, and the space, financial space to say yes to a project for less money, I'll do it. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, Maartje Stut, hoe bepaal je of je portfolio goed divers genoeg is voordat je een opdrachtgever benadert? Interesting question. I'm sorry to say, but I cannot remember the last time that I reached out to someone. Um, I'm fortunate enough, and that's also part of YouTube, YouTube's power maybe, or I don't know. Um, people have always reached out to me. So it's either through people that I know um, or through Instagram, through YouTube, through my website, that people came to me and asked me if I was available for something. I maybe a couple times really early on in my career that I asked, um, hey, do you need filmmakers? But that never ended up being something. But I hear stories about uh, people doing this on LinkedIn and that really works. And I just, yeah, I, I would just go for it. I mean, the, the worst thing they can say is no. I mean, they're not going to scream at you or something. So if you have a couple of videos that you're proud of, you're good, you know? Um, yeah, and also try to make your own work. Like portfolio work is really important. Like free portfolio work, something that you have in mind, something that you dream about, just do it that way because that definitely adds your portfolio and something that really worked well for me. So that's it. All right, next up, 
Ah, another one from Maartje. Hoe begon je betaalde klussen te krijgen of vond je, waar vond je deze? So I started off as a production assistant. Um, then I worked my way up, uh, you know, within the production chain, I'd say. I was a junior producer. Then I was an art assistant, set dresser sometimes. But alongside that, I was making my own videos. So my own YouTube short videos and short documentary pieces. Um, and actually that portfolio then you know, got me newer clients. And it was because of that, that people found me, basically, because I was working so hard and putting everything on Instagram and Facebook and just exploiting myself, you know? It's just very important to be out there and be on top of mind. And the way to do it is through Instagram, maybe YouTube, maybe LinkedIn, posts like every other day, you know, something like that. Um, so, yeah. The payments were low in the beginning, but they gradually increased as I gained confidence and felt more comfortable asking higher prices, basically. All right. TH Films asks, of course, I'm an experienced filmmaker, but I have no experience with YouTube. Any tips are welcome. Um, that's a hard one, man. I mean, YouTube is a really complex pr uh, platform, but the best thing is just to start, just post something. I mean, I switched from being a self-development guy that, you know, looked at Matt Diavella to filmmaking reviews, to lighting tutorials, to DaVinci Resolve tutorials. I did it all. You know, it's, it doesn't matter. I mean, probably have grown faster if I stick to one topic, but I don't care. You know, I had fun doing it. So that's the most important thing, you know. Um, I think just try things out. But the most important thing is to just do it post that video. Uh, then he asked another question, what's your goal for YouTube? And do you have tips for a beginner uh, on YouTube like me? My goal for YouTube is to build it out um, as a community. So I'm building a community at the moment, filmmakers community. Um, but my personal goal is to talk about more of the stuff that happens behind the curtains, right? So it's routine, sleep, um, exercise, all those things that really help in order to stay healthy as a freelancer, um, both physically and mentally. Uh, those things, you know, the finance things, I want to talk about money. I think money is amazing and very interesting. So uh, that's more of my goal. Yeah, I want to expand it a little bit. Now it's very niche, but I want to expand it a bit more so that more people can learn from this stuff and myself included. <laughs> all right. Luke Films asks, how can I arrive to 1,000 followers for uh, for stat to monetize, start to monetize, I think? Post videos. Share them on Instagram, share them on Facebook, but post good quality, post good quality content and followers will come. You know, it's a matter of uh, consistency and quality. I think quality is most important. Uh, consistency comes next, but still, in the beginning, consistency is really important. All right, next up is a question from Fyodor. The route from pays the bills to being able to invest in big projects like the studio. Okay, so this is an interesting one because it is kind of the same answer that I already gave. It's gradually increasing your money that you ask for projects, but you know that has to come from a certain um, confidence um, and also, of course, a good portfolio. Um, but what it also is, is that right now I don't have any money. <laughs> People think that I'm rich. I, I have gotten that statement from someone like, hey, man, you're rich and you're, you're earning loads of money. That's bullshit. I have no money. <laughs> all that money is in the studio. All that money is in my car. All that money is gone into gear. So it's, you know, I see these past four years have, as a big investment into my business. And right now my main focus is to, you know, save up some money in order to you know, buy a house perhaps, or, you know, build a living. But uh, yeah, I, I basically invested every penny I earned back into my business. So as you grow bigger, you'll, you know, either can save the money or you can spend it on uh, on gear and stuff. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard balance, but I chose the gear way because now I have all the equipment and I can use it on my own projects, which gives me a lot of freedom. So yeah. All right, next up, Dom J. Guild. I'm curious as, how to many, uh, as to how many paid opportunities you could attribute 100% to YouTube. Uh, the Sony project uh, for Indonesia was one, Iceland project this year, which is not released yet, is one. Um, yeah, there's... 
A couple more, I did talk about a little bit in my other video, but then I also had a hard time remembering exactly what it was, but um, I'm working on a feature documentary right now, which definitely comes from YouTube because the, the director found me through, uh, through one of my color grading videos, like what? So that's cool. Um, and you know, projects that I don't even know of, maybe people found me through Google or YouTube that way, but I, dare to say that a good 50% of my income is to thanks to YouTube alone. Next, my buddy Set Reset Films, how to save money and build a buffer for those slow periods instead of buying new gear. Don't ask me that question. I'm terrible at that. I don't have savings right now. All that stuff is in the studio. I'm trying to save up money now. Like this, you know, second part of the year is something that I you know, had, has half told, half said to myself, wow, to save up money and build up a buffer, but I spend everything on gear. Yep. It's not safe, but it's a risk. Um, and it's a calculated risk. You know, I have a good insurance. I have good life insurance, like uh, health insurance, uh, also for my freelancing work. Uh, so if something happens, I am covered. That also costs a lot of money, but it's, you know, yeah, I mean, investing in, in, in gear is very important in my opinion because you can use it, but you need the jobs for it. So that's also a calculation you need to do. Do you have the work? If yes, buy the gear because you can rent it out to yourself and make more money and you know earn back all that equipment. So yeah, but building a buffer is something that I'm doing right now. So I'm with you, man. <laughs> all right, next. Claudio W, is money your motivation or has it changed more now you know um, you can make money, more money on YouTube? Money has never been the motivation to start YouTube. I mean, I started YouTube because I just wanted to make videos and push myself and, you know, be dedicated to this one thing, you know, like be on YouTube, make videos every week uh, and learn a lot. So um, of course, gradually when more sort of requests came in about money and people wanted to sponsor, then I did think about money. And as I mentioned in, in, in the uh, reply to Matthijs de Deugd, I saw YouTube as a business a couple times and whenever I did, I felt horrible. You know, I started losing motivation. I started losing my passion. And so I, I, I just tried to not do that anymore. And I'll just try to see YouTube as my side hustle that I would love to build out, you know, build out into a bigger community. And of course, make money off of so I can spend more time on YouTube. But it's never the main purpose of me being on YouTube. Um... By Niels Winter, a Dutch one. Uh, what is your verhouding to see your ver klanten and YouTube? Uh, bijvoorbeeld, één dag content, vier dag klanten. Yeah, it's really difficult because my um, my freelance work is very sporadic. Right now, I do a, a big gig, like thirty something days, and some other projects in between. But I spend a lot of time on YouTube, and I spend a lot of time on um, filmmakers community. I spend a lot of time on all these side projects that all have something to do with YouTube. So I definitely think that it is a good 75% YouTube and a 25% freelance work. And the freelance work that I do is then on set for a good amount of money. So that way I can sustain myself this way. And of course, maybe it shifts at some point, you know, if a bigger project comes in and I do like a full month on set, then definitely I, I do that and I'll just leave YouTube for what it is, you know. Um, but if I have the time, I always spend it on YouTube, either thinking out video ideas or thinking out a plan to make it work, you know, and to keep it fun. That's most important. Um, next, Joya, uh, how much money did you invest in your own studio? I'd say a good 25,000 euros. I think that's around what we, what we spend on this place in total. To me, it's a ridiculous amount of money, yeah. Took a long time to get that money. Then a scope on what? How long after you started your, your your channel did you actually start earning something with it? Um, that was a long time. I think the first like real sponsor deal that I've gotten was a thousand euros per video. Was in uh, March 2022. So it's a long time. It's three years. Uh, of course, I did make some ad revenue, but. 
Um, also, the, the stock footage did work really well. So me being on Artlist, you know, the Artlist footage catalog really did well for me. So I, I just dumped all my videos that I had that were of good quality and they, you know, d got downloaded and I got money for that. But they give me, gave me some good money. But um, yeah, it's it has been a long time. Uh, but still, I mean, I see the YouTube and my freelance career as a parallel sort of path and they, my YouTube gets bigger, me as a freelancer gets bigger. So it's, it, you know, it helps one another. Um, so I think as I gained more followers, so in 2022, I, I went from like 1,000 to 18,000, I think. Um, that's also the year that my income like quadrupled. So it's, yeah, it's basically something that sort of went along with each other. Oh, it's a weird answer. Sorry, Dennis. <laughs> All right. Next up, Nick Nibby. How much would you, how much would each hour of labor make you? Oh, there's a first one. Say if you'd work 24 hours on one video of 12 minutes and the video in your, in your view does well, how much would you earn uh, each hour of labor you make? Wow. Nothing. I mean, I did a calculation of the amount of hours and um, uh, money I made from YouTube ad revenue alone, and it was a 20 cents per hour. Yeah, that's not a lot of money, and I know it, and I still love it. So it's, um, for now, I mean, my, my, my income on YouTube is not great, but perhaps that changes, you know, in the future. Who knows? Next up, Thor Seas. Thor, Thor Chaos, Thor Chaos. Yeah. How do you combine freelance work with staying consistent on YouTube? This is the hardest because whenever I do a big project and I don't have time to work on YouTube videos and I didn't make anything in advance, I just go rogue. <laughs> um, that's just how I do it right now. Now I made a lot of videos in advance, like eight. So I have a lot of content to post for the coming months. But, um, you know, this is the first time I, I did it this way and it, it has been a lot of work, but yeah, in general, it's just really hard because if there's a good gig coming by that pays well, I just focus fully on that. You know, I also cannot afford to, you know, spend half of my attention on that gig and half of my attention on YouTube. If I have a good paying gig for a full month, I just go for it and YouTube comes next. But whenever I do have the time, for example, this July, I have a lot of time. Um, I focus on, on YouTube a lot and I try to work as hard as I can to mix as many videos of good quality as I can. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a bit of both really. Yeah. All right. Hopefully this was a, a bit of information. Uh, hopefully I answered your question correctly. I didn't get to answer all of the questions because there were just too many. Um, so yeah, if you have any other questions, please leave them down in the comments below and I'll make sure to get back to you. Uh, sorry if it was a bit of a, uh, like a, but I've been talking a lot. <laughs> All right, I've got a question to you. Would you be interested in a live, if I go live on YouTube? Would you, you know, come and visit me on YouTube when I go live? Let me know. All right, see you guys in the next video.